The Vikings were Scandinavian raiders who came by sea beginning in the late 8th century. Their specialized longboats and navigational skill made them a formidable opponent. Here's an example of their longboat. Another example, a real example, here's an actual one from the museum in Oslo, Norway. And here's a image, almost contemporary, from the uh, Bayou Tapestry. Now, using these longboats, um, they were able to sail both oceans and rivers. They showed up in several parts of Europe and caused terror in their wake. Um, you could find them in, they made their way to France, even coming around the Iberian Peninsula and coming to Marseille. Um, they also made their way ev uh, even to uh, Slavic Northeast and down the rivers to Byzantium. They even got to Byzantium. Um, and then, of course, they really liked going to Ireland and to England, both from the east, or sorry, from the western part of England and directly from Denmark to the, uh, to the east. The reason they're so attracted to England was mainly because um, there were so many monasteries there, monasteries with precious metals, and so, and monasteries are easy to kill because at this point, monks aren't fighting. So here we have an example right here of them slaughtering monks to get their precious metals. Here's another example. Uh, you get the idea. These guys are not friendly. The, the complaints are really uh, awful. They, they did some terrible things. Um, the uh, common petition at the time, it's an urban legend, but they say that there used to be a prayer, A furore norma norum liberanos domine, from the fury of the Northmen, deliver us, O Lord. And even though that particular prayer is an urban legend, nevertheless, there was some truth to it. They really did, uh, oh, by the way, I've got to get my berserker in there. Here's a crazy uh, Viking berserker. Um, they really were a terror. Before I go from this slide, I should also mention that they even made it from Norway to Iceland, from Iceland to Greenland, and eventually all the way to Canada. They made it to Canada by 1000 AD. So they're pretty, uh, they, they, they got everywhere. Now before we go on with England, I should just mention that this is a general characteristic of the Vikings, this pattern of being offered land, settling down, and assimilating. Um, when Vikings were raiding on the seas, they were a terror. But when Vikings settled down, you wanted them. They normally organized very quickly and built a strong economy and political structure, forging new trade routes and creating strong administrative bureaucracies. They also tend to be very pious Christians once they were converted, with a very real piety and a very deep practical faith. So just to give some examples, um, just give me a second here. Um, in 862, a group of Swedish Vikings led by Rurik had been offered rulership of Novgorod by the local Slavs. This would eventually become the Kievan Rus, the predecessor to Russia. Um, eventually, they would convert to Orthodox Christianity, appreciating its heavenly liturgies. Then in 988, to commemorate that, um, the Vikings in uh, some other Swedish Vikings, after threatening Constantinople several times, they were offered a job by the Byzantine Emperor Basil II to be his personal guard, in recognition of the fact that they converted to Orthodox Christianity were zealous Orthodox Christians. This highly effective bodyguard became a core, an elite core of the army, and became known as the Varangian Guard. So they're down there in the Byzantine Empire. Um, then, in 911, a band of Norwegian and Danish Vikings coming down the Seine, so here they are, they're Danish and Norwegian, coming down the Seine River, threatened to attack Paris. But instead, King Charles the Simple convinced them to take land in northern France instead. So here they are. This is Rollo. Duke Rollo was this Viking leader. Um, they took this land in uh, northern France, um, today called Normandy. Um, they quickly settled there and married Frankish wives. They learned French. They learned the feudal system. And then they quickly executed it better than anybody else before them. They became the most efficient feudal um, lords of Europe. They also became skilled horsemen and are largely responsible for much of the medieval concept of knighthood chivalry. They became known as the Normans, literally the Northmen, and their land, the Duchy of Normandy. And finally, in 1016, a group of these very Normans um, from Normandy stopped by Galgano, Italy, on their way back from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So they went all the way to the Holy Land, then on their way back they stopped by Galgano, Italy. Galgano is this little heel of the boot in Italy. When they were there, they were shocked at the way that the local Lombards let the Muslim Saracens collect tribute from them. At this point, the uh, Muslims actually had Sicily and some parts of southern Italy. Um, so they offered their services to beat the Saracens back, and they did. They succeeded, and they beat the Saracens back out of southern Italy all the way back to Sicily. 
Eventually, they were rewarded by being granted a fief. But the thing is with these Vikings, with these Normans, as soon as you give them a fief, they begin to develop a, f a strong foothold, and they invited all their friends from Normandy to come down. Yay, land in southern Italy. Um, and eventually, they took over all of South Italy, creating a very prosperous multicultural state. Multicultural in the sense that um, Lombards, Byzantines, Muslims, Normans, um, and even Jews were all there together living in this southern state. At one point, they even beat back the Pope's forces in battle. They basically, oh, sorry, just give me a second here. I didn't mean to draw that line. Um, can't get rid of it now. I don't know why. But anyway, they beat back the Pope's forces in battle, and they apologized right afterwards. They said, yes, we're faithful Catholics. We love the Pope, but it really is our land, Holy Father, if you just would recognize that. The Pope was so impressed with them, he legitimized their holding on southern Italy, and, uh, and that began what was called the Kingdom of Sicily, because eventually they also conquered Sicily. So the whole, kingdom of, the whole Norman Kingdom of southern, of, of southern Italy was called the Kingdom of Sicily. That's just to make a point that this is the basic trend of the Vikings. The two forces met at Hastings. The Battle of Hastings proved to be a long, hard fight, but in the end, the exhausted Anglo-Saxon forces, having just traveled the entire length of England, proved no match for the Norman cavalry. Harold himself died in the battle. We can see. And then on Christmas Day of the same year, 1066, Duke William of Normandy was crowned as King William I of England. This was the Norman Conquest, is known as the Norman Conquest, and William is now more commonly known as William the Conqueror. Now that we've introduced the Norman House, the first of the Norman uh, of the royal houses of England, it's time to review a mnemonic device that can help you remember your houses of England. And we're going to go through a lot of them in this very uh, lecture right here. Um, the mnemonic device is no plan like yours to study history wisely. And that is, that stands for Norman, your first house of England is Norman, the one we just talked about, the beginning of. Then there's Plantagenet. Then there's Lancaster. Then there's York. Then there's the Tudor House. The Stuarts. The Hanover House, that's the one during the American Revolution, and the House of Windsor, which is still there today. Now, this Norman conquest had a lot of effects. King William definitely left his Norman mark on England. During his lifetime, he consolidated royal power in England immensely. In fact, in a time when nations were only beginning to form and when kings slowly became, were becoming sovereigns over their lands, England quickly became the most powerful kingdom in Europe, something that all the other kings were only dreaming of when it comes to royal power. For one thing, one of the ways he did this was he composed the Domesday Book. He got a lot of smart people, and they composed this Domesday Book, so-called because like Doomsday, like the end of the world, there was no appeal beyond it once it was written. It was an exhaustive record of the boundaries and the owners of almost every single piece of land in England and parts of Wales. It is still used even today in some legal cases in Britain. William also did something that made the feudal system work for him in his favor. Again, he's a Norman, so he knows how to use the feudal system to his advantage. Um, he made his nobles swear, in this particular event right here, that all the land in England belonged directly to him, and that whoever held land in England held it from him, and that everybody's first fealty, their first feudal allegiance, was to the king, not to their local lord, but always to the king. This event is known as the Oath of Salisbury Plain, and it did a lot to consolidate the king's power in England. The pious Norman William also continued the monastic ecclesiastical tradition of England by endowing several new monasteries to pray for his soul. This started a tradition in England of lords endowing monasteries that would eventually result in lots of religious orders, Benedictines, Cistercians, Augustinians, Trappists, Carthusians, Premonstratensians, Dominicans, Franciscans, Carmelites, Brigitines, Poor Clares, etc., owning up to a third of the land of England by the time of Henry VIII. It's well explained here by Terry Jones in this here video. A warrior's soul was not an easy one to save. In fact, it required a strenuous effort by a significant number of people to pray his way out. After the Battle of Hastings, for example, the church demanded 120 days of penance for everyone killed. William the Conqueror, in his lifetime, must have been responsible for something like hmm, 10,000 deaths. That's about 3,300 years of penance. He wouldn't have finished yet. 
not until the year 4,366. However, if the work was split up amongst a couple of hundred monks, William could have his soul cleansed in less than 18 years. So he founded a string of abbeys to pray for his soul. In fact, anyone who had any money would deem it only wise to invest a bit of it in the innocence of monks. And far from living lives of extreme poverty and discomfort... Okay, there. Sorry, I had some trouble stopping that. Let's just get rid of it now. We don't need that anymore. So... When these monks and monasteries and nuns behaved, these monasteries contributed a lot to the infrastructure and general well-being of the people of England. They took care of the poor, established communication, and in many cases turned inhospitable areas into areas of self-sufficiency. Remember, monks have to make their own food and everything. They have to make a self-sufficient society, and often um, towns would therefore gather around them. They already had everything that was needed, so entire towns would grow up around these monasteries. Um, another thing that changed as a result of the Norman Conquest was the English language. Now, this takes a while, so I'm going very fast here. This is going to take about 300, uh, actual, uh, 300 to 400 years to happen, but nevertheless, it starts now. The court language of the New England was Norman French. Slowly but surely, French vocabulary would be added to Anglo-Saxon. Middle English would start to take shape as English itself gained more respectability, particularly in the 14th century. Think of the Canterbury Tales, for instance, of Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, that's a good example of Middle English. But speaking of French, or more speaking of France, there was one, one last legacy of the Norman Conquest that would complicate Western European history. William now, by the conquest, was king of England. Um, but he, was also, he also retained his title as Duke of Normandy. By the latter, he was a vassal to the king of France. But by the former, he was the king of France's equal, perhaps even the king of France's superior. For the control of, of William over all of England was far greater than the control of the king of France in Paris over, the, uh, over France. Um, these Capetian kings of France really only direct, uh, exercised direct control over the Ile de France, a small area around Paris. The rest was controlled by lords and dukes, including Normandy itself, ruled by the Duke of Normandy. France does not have the solid power that England has. William did try to simplify these things by leaving England to his son William when he died um, and Normandy to his son Robert, but that would only last a generation. Um, eventually, William II was murdered, um, and uh, his son Henry took over, Henry I, and conquered Normandy for himself. Oh, sorry. So he's both uh, king of Normandy and, sorry, king of England and Duke of Normandy again. In general, this is a very Norman characteristic. The intricate Norman mind and the self-righteous Norman will tends to insist on all of its titles, even if it involves complications. Wherever they have gained ground, they stay, adapting as they must. Just look at their mid-11th century holdings. The Normans by the mid-11th century have England, they have Normandy, they have, uh, let's see, England, they have Normandy and northern France, they have southern Italy, the king of Sicily. From the king of Sicily, they also conquered parts of North Africa, Tunisia, and Libya, and they also have the principality of Antioch from the First Crusade. The Normans are everywhere, and they stick once they're there. They influence culture heavily, architecture, knighthood, etc. Unfortunately, Henry I would be the last king of the Norman house. His only living son died, um, along with most of the young nobility, in a major tragedy where all the nobles were in this ship going across the English Channel, the White Ship Tragedy, where they all sunk in, in a storm. Uh, it was because the crew was drunk. Um, the White Ship Tragedy of 1120. Henry was heartbroken, as you can see in this picture. Here he is mourning. Um, that was a common theme in art uh, the, of the time, the mourning of Henry I over the White Ship Tragedy. But he lost his heir. That was the main problem. He lost his male heir. Um, this disaster shipwreck in the English Channel would have a profound impact. Henry tried to provide for the future by having the remaining nobles of England agree to, naming, to his naming of his daughter, Matilda, Empress Matilda. She was called Empress Matilda because she was once married to the Holy Roman Emperor himself. Now, he's dead by this point, but nevertheless, they still call her Empress Matilda. And now she is the heir, a girl, a woman, is an heir to the throne of England. The problem is, when push came to shove, when Henry actually died in 1135, they didn't like the idea of a woman, and Stephen of Blois, the uh, cousin of, uh, of Henry I, um, usurped the throne. For the next 20 years, there was horrible civil war, a period that has become known as the Anarchy. 
the well-ordered kingdom that William I and Henry I had created to send into lawlessness, oppression of the lowly, and general poverty. As you can see right here, there's a picture from the time of the anarchy of these uh, knights taking over a farmer's land. Um, Christ, and, his, and here's a farm not producing anything, although it's from a much later picture. Christ and his saints slept, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle put it. The anarchy initiated by the White Ship tragedy would only be ended in 1154 when Matilda's son, Henry Fitz Empress Plantagenet, would defeat Stephen and be crowned. He becomes the King of England. Um, he's the first of the Plantagenet House. We're now in the Plantagenet House of England. Henry became a very powerful person. In addition to England, he was also Count of Anjou down here, um, inheriting this title from his father, Geoffrey. Matilda's second husband. Here it is right here. Matilda, of course, her first husband was the Holy Roman Emperor, but then she married Geoffrey of Anjou, and that's how Henry, their son, had the title of Anjou. Um, he also, let's see, and he left that title to Henry as well. I'm sorry. Uh, Geoffrey of Anjou also had conquered Normandy. So by the time Henry was born, Henry also became the Duke of Normandy. Um, and then also, the next stroke of luck was Henry married Eleanor of Aquitaine, the most powerful woman in Europe. She herself had once been married to the King of France. Um, they eventually dissolved that marriage because he apparently was unable to produce children. Um, and, but uh, then she married Henry, and that marriage gave Henry Aquitaine, which she ruled in her own name, and Gascony, which she also ruled in her own name. Finally, Henry himself conquered other parts of France, notably Brittany. Thus, for a long time, the kings of England, of England would have many claims in what is today France. In England, Henry began a new era, the House of Plantagenet. If the Norman House is characterized as a time of consolidation of the English king's power, the Plantagenet House could perhaps be characterized as a time of consolidation of the king's justice. The main goal of Henry II was to restore the order of his grandfather, Henry I, and to bury the chaos of the anarchy. Concretely, this meant removing the administration of justice from the hands of local lords who, during the anarchy, had either been negligent, haphazard, arbitrary, and sometimes downright oppressive. From now on, in Henry's mind, there had to be one common justice, the king's justice. To achieve this, um, Representatives of the king, called justices in air or itinerant justices, would travel to the various shires, to the various shires, and administer justice in the king's name. So these guys worked for the king, not for the local lord. Now, since law had basically been non-existent um, in the anarchy, and the immediate need for order outstripped any possible pace of legislation. The decisions of these itinerant justices became law, according to the principle of case precedent, or stare decisis, um, that is, to stand by the things decided. This, in other words, whatever the judges said became law, because every other judge had to follow a similar procedure whenever they met with a similar case. This is the distinguishing feature of the common law system, which along with the Justinian-based civil law system and the Muslim-based Sharia law system, Sharia, uh, Sharia law system, is one of the three major legal systems in the world today. Um, it's our system too, as you see right here. I'll just give me a second. Let me put this so it's in the front. Um, if, uh, as you see in this map right here, it covers a good portion of the world. Anything in this brownish maroon color is the common law system that was started by England. So we follow it. Um, the other uh, English colonies of Africa follow it, India, Australia, anything from, that's colonized from England basically follows the English common law system. And it all started with Henry. Um, just for uh, the blue is civil law system, and, and influenced by the uh, Byzantine emperor Justinian, um, so anything in the blue. And then the, uh, this goldish orange is the Sharia law system of Islam. So it's a very powerful legal system, very influential, and it all started with Henry. No sooner was Richard ransomed than he entered a long war over territory in France. This is because King Philip II Augustus of France was trying to achieve for France what William the Conqueror had achieved a century ago for England, the consolidation of royal power. But his main obstacle to this was the presence of the Angevin holdings in France. As long as the kings of England would also held land in France, it would be hard to convince the other nobles of France that the king was lord over them. After all, there was the king of England himself who owned land in France, theoretically subject to France, but he was also a king. So it's hard to believe that the king really owns France. Unfortunately, 
Richard was too good of a warrior for Philip. In other words, Philip was not making any headway during the t as long as Richard was alive. His goals would have to wait for a weaker king of England. But in the meantime, the two got some good trash talking in, especially as Richard was building um, Chateau Gaillard to defend Normandy, one of the greatest castles of its time. Actually, the greatest castle of its time. It was, uh, um, it was a state-of-the-art castle that Richard built. As he was building it, um, Philip II of Augustus trash talked and said, Hey, Richard, even if its walls are made of iron, yet would I take them. And Richard replied, Hey, Philip, even were its walls made of butter, yet would I hold them. Despite all his efforts, Richard was killed by a boy with a crossbow in 1199. His only living brother, John, took over, the only king of that name in English history. And that's because he was not a popular king as Okay, you get the idea. Uh, a couple of things about that song. If you notice, it was a direct reference to the Angevin rage. He throws an angry tantrum when he cannot have his way. And also um, a reference to Eleanor of Aquitaine. He sucks his thumb while he's calling for his mom. The relationship between Eleanor and John was actually not very good. John was the favorite boy of his father, not his mother. But uh, that's another thing. Also, he was not too late to be known as John the First. He is the first and only king of England to be named John. So he, he was not too late to be. But the, the song does convey the fact that John is not a liked king. There are several reasons for the unpopularity of King John Lackland, as he was called. For although he received that name because orig Henry originally left no land to him, he did indeed lose almost all of the Angevin land in France, thus making the name doubly appropriate. For as soon as King Richard died, King Philip II Augustus of France ha, 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 knew he had a chance. After much fighting, Chateau Gaillard itself was fell in 1204, being taken by the French. After several undermining attempts, you can see the undermining attempts right here, um, the French soldiers finally climbed up through the toilets and took the castle. With that, the kings of England um, lost almost all of their lands in France. You can see what it was like during the time of Richard, and now you see what it's like during the time of John. All they have left is Gascony, which they continued to hold as a fief from the king of France. Philip II Augustus is achieving the dream, the dream that England already has, and now the dream that, that France is slowly getting. Though this part of France that the, that the uh, English still hold is small, it will be enough to cause major problems later, as we shall see. In a sense, John also lost all England the very next year. That's because the See of Canterbury, Canterbury was vacant. And as was traditional for the kings of England, John named someone of his choice for the bishopric. That's what they've always done. But this is not the middle, early Middle Ages any longer. The Pope at this time is Innocent III. Yes, none other than Innocent III, the most powerful Pope as far as, uh, as, far as just pure temporal power is concerned in all of history, the height of papal power using all the machinery of the Gregorian Reform to be a true moderator over all Christendom. You all remember the Gregorian Reform. They got a lot of centralization and structure in place to reform the church, but now Innocent is using it also to tell kings what to do. Um, Pope Innocent named someone else, Stephen Langton, as Archbishop of Canterbury. In the ensuing dispute, Innocent excommunicated John and uh, absolved all Englishmen from obedience to him. John now had to play by the Pope's rules, and the price was heavy. Innocent declared that all of England was now forfeit to the Pope, and John had to receive it back as a fee from him if he wanted to be restored to the fold of Christendom. John agreed. He had no choice. Here he is right here, um, making an oath of fealty to none other than the Pope, admitting that he receives England as a fief from the Pope. Thus, William the Conqueror was the one that made sure that all land in England technically belonged to the king. But now in John's reign, it technically belonged to the Pope. This is quite a humiliation for the kings of England. Needless to say, this didn't help John's reputation among his nobles. Then there was the fact that John was collecting taxes in almost any way he could to pay for a future war against the king of France in order to get his land back. 
the barons and bishops of England, led by none other than Stephen Langton himself, the Archbishop of Canterbury, chosen by Pope Innocent, finally put their foot down. In a plain at Runnymede in 1215 AD, John was forced to sign the Magna Carta, an agreement that prevented the king from raising taxes without his barons' consent, limited the king and put him under the oversight of 25 barons, known as the General Council, protected the liberties of the church, and in general destroyed the notion that the king was above the law and could act arbitrarily. This ended the rule of Angevin anger, and there is some irony in the fact that Britain's tradition of constitutional monarchy, that is, monarchy limited by a constitution, owes its first beginnings to none other than King John. Now, this is, not the be this is only the beginning. There are going to be other Plantagenet achievements that move towards the modern-day England, and the next step in this direction would take place under John's grandson, Edward I Longshanks. You've heard of him before, perhaps, if you saw Braveheart. Um, unlike his grandfather and father, Henry III, Edward Longshanks was another warrior like Richard. As prince, he even led the Ninth Crusade. Unfortunately, this crusade was cut short because Edward was stabbed by the poisonous dagger of a Hashashin, or assassin, um, a member of a radical Shiite sect that couldn't get along with anybody and used the tactic of taking out the leaders of their many enemies. Edward overpowered and killed the assassin, but he was too weak to continue the crusade. As it turned out, it was the last crusade to Outremer, the Holy Land, beyond the sea. Outremer is literally French for beyond the sea. The crusader spirit was dying in Europe. The crusades proved to be much harder than anyone expected, and nations were beginning to come into their own, seeking their own identities apart from this general name of Christendom. They wanted to be France. They wanted to be England. They wanted to be Scotland, etc. Edward would also come to experience this incipient nationalism directly when he became king after his return from the crusade, um, king of England. His reign is especially known for his attempts to solidify the ancient claims to Wales and Scotland. With Wales, he succeeded and proceeded to build several castles in Wales to establish the English presence. These castles came with colonies of Englishmen. But Scotland, Scotland fought back hard and led by William Wallace and Robert de Bruce, won its independence, at least for now. Of course, all this war also cost money, which is our main point, the next step towards the British constitutional monarchy that is part of the Plantagenet legacy. Um, basically, since these wars cost money, Edward had to, he needed new revenue. But King Edward went beyond the stipulations of the Magna Carta. In 1295 AD, he demanded that not only would his new taxes be approved by the Great Council, but he wanted two knights from every county two burgesses from every borough, and two citizens from every city to join the council of barons and bishops, and the king even asked them for their consent. They were not merely advisory. He asked them for their consent in raising new taxes. Edward wanted to make sure that he had the backing of the common people when he made further demands of them. This meeting is known as the Model Parliament because it provided the idea for England's bicameral consultative and later legislative body consisting of a House of Lords and a House of Commons. The Plantagenet House, indeed, was defining the future England in more ways than one. 